It's uh, my pleasure now uh, to introduce uh, our two panellists to discuss conflict and trade implications for Australia and to comment on uh, uh, perhaps a couple of the things that the Parliamentary Secretary had to say. Um, Alan Oxley, of course, is one of Australia's uh, most uh, authoritative advisers on interna international trade. Having worked in the bureaucracy, having uh, left the bureaucracy and worked uh, in a variety of national and international forums over a period of time, he is one of Australia's foremost commentators in this area and we're delighted that he agreed to come and speak uh, to us today. Susan Harris-Rimmer uh, is an expert in women's rights, global governance and international law, all of which I think had uh, major implications in uh, the G20 outcomes, both in Australia and previously, and as well uh, we were delighted that she has uh, uh, agreed to come and speak on our panel today. Um, I'm going to ask Alan to speak firstly, then Susan, and as again we'll uh, open it up for some questions. Alan, thank you. Uh, thanks very much. I thought I would um, just wanted to underline a couple of points about the importance of the trade agreements because the, the range of agreements that we're entering into now are actually pointing us ultimately to a huge agreement which will, is among all APEC economies and the, the bases for that are now being laid in the two regional agreements to which the Parliamentary Secretary referred. There's agreement in APEC to develop this agreement and I think we'll start to see it in about a decade's time. It will encompass 60% of world growth. It will have China, Japan and United States in it this was really extremely significant. Now, the interesting thing is, is the point the Parliamentary Secretary made is that trade, in fact, is a civilising process, particularly when it's wrapped up with legally binding agreements. You can't have legally binding agreements with states that don't function. So Syria, in a sense, doesn't count. I'm always remembered that the thing that intrigued me most years ago is that if you think back 25 years ago, 30 years ago, Brazil and Argentina had nuclear weapons capacities which they're aiming at each other. It wasn't until they scrapped those capacities and created democratic governments that they're then able to the join trade agreements to start to accept agreements and bind their trade that way. They're still not very good at it, I might say. It's the countries which stick to the rules clearly, the ones that get a better growth. And these two don't fully get into that category. But China is, in fact, the interesting case. I don't believe that the Chinese government would allow conflict in the South China Sea to interfere with its trade relationships with its major neighbours. They are just too important. It's quite interesting that China chose to join the WTO, chose to use those rules as part of its process of reform, and it's continuing down that path. So in a sense, therefore, trade, as I said before, is very civilising. But I wanted to, in fact, focus, touch a bit more, less on military conflict than political conflict, because we Australians have got quite a significant problem with our closest neighbour. This has been an old hobby horse of mine. I've just always been interested in Indonesia. I did Indonesian studies when I was a student. I married my wife because she had Indonesian interests. And I think... <laughs> not financial. <laughs> <laughs> what we do need to understand about Indonesia is that we are not on the Indonesian radar screen. In fact, nobody is because Indonesia has what I call bigism. India, China, United States. You ask someone in the United States where they're from, they say they're from Vermont. They don't say they're from the US. You ask someone in China where they're from, they'll tell you the province. You ask someone in Indonesia where they're from, they'll tell you it's the, it's the area they live in. I was reminded years ago, I was engaged in an exercise with a gentleman called Bob Hassan, who was one of President Suharto's um, business partners, let's call him that. I remember having a conversation with Hassan at one point because Indonesia was toying with some trade arrangements to give favour to Korean car manufacturers. And I said to him, you know... You're going to you get the Japanese and the Americans taking cases against you in the GATT because what you're going to be doing here breaches those rules. I said there may be a better way to deal with it. And he paused and he looked at me and this is a guy who used to play golf with Sahato. He would have had a conversation on the 19th hole every week with Sahato. And he said, the Americans? He said, you know, he said, um, we beat the Dutch. We beat the Japanese. We beat the communists. We can beat the Americans. <laughs> That's the perspective which is in the mindset of a country of 240 million who basically sees the world from inside. And what troubles me hugely about our relationships is that we're going to have continuing conflicts of the sort that we've had recently. They're going to continue and it's going to be incumbent on us to make them work and succeed. And we're going to have to put up with some unpleasantness. But if we don't work at this, they're our biggest wheat market now. They'll be a big beef market. They'll be important dairy market. Uh, we're going to find ourselves in considerable difficulty. Indonesia is not being taught in primary schools anymore of any significance. Most Australians go to Indonesia, go to Bali, don't realise they're Indonesia. Now they might. But that 
it's an old joke. In fact, I mentioned to a journalist recently who is working from the Australian in Jakarta, he said because he was there with his partner, he had to leave Indonesia every month to get his visa renewed. He went to Singapore to do that. One of his mates said, why don't you go to Bali? <laughs> Symptomatic of a very significant problem, but this economy is growing at 7% every year. It's done that every year for the last 30 years. It'll continue in a decade's time. Its GDP will equal ours. Its ability to spend on defence will equal ours. It straddles our sea lanes. We have a major challenge in order to establish a relationship and working with them. And I think in that sense, the political conflict we have to manage is going to be an interesting one with our trade interests. I might leave it at that. Thank you, Al. Susan, please, thank you. Thank you. Well, I thought it would be very useful to think about the transformation of Australia from an old to new economy to starting to think about how we would pursue transformational trade policy uh, in terms of diplomacy. We know trade is a very ancient form of diplomacy, but it's been disrupted in ways that we can't even imagine to the point where WikiLeaks can leak your uh, health and IP chapters online. So <coughs> um, the parliamentary secretary gave us an idea about how conflict, political conflict, can affect trade. I'm more with Alan. I'm interested in how trade can be a source of social and, and uh, political conflict because trade is a site where there are winners and losers, both within and between nations. It's a highly political terrain. And at the moment, what we have is a, a very ancient form of trade negotiation, which is secret, elite, technocratic. And it's brushing up against these transnational social movements uh, uh, and also against the, uh, the online environment where nothing is secret anymore. So at the moment, uh, I'd like to quote Nancy Pelosi because she's in, embroiled in a really interesting debate within the Democrats in the US about the fast track agreement. It's always very hard for the US. They go out and negotiate these ambitious things and they have to get it through their own Congress, right? That's where the rubber always hits the road. Uh, so she just told the USA Today, um, she said, in order to succeed in the global economy, it is necessary to move beyond stale arguments of protectionism versus free trade. Today, driven by a new technological revolution, national markets are being transformed into global networks of finance, production and distribution. Markets for goods, money and even labour are integrating across borders beyond the reach of national legislative bodies. And I think as we sit in the Commonwealth Parliament of Australia, that's something we really need to think about, how that global value chains and other disruptions to trade mean that parts of what is happening in the trade arena are going beyond the reach of national legislative bodies. So we're getting a whole lot of fundamentals in the trade world uh, being disrupted. Uh, we're looking at goods made in the world in terms of global value chains, as John Ravenhill calls it. Uh, he, and one of the implications of that is that most um, international trade uh, statistics, he thinks, are completely uh, obsolete because they're based on um, uh, gross basis rather than value add, which is not how the world works anymore. And so we used to fret about bilateral trade imbalances. He thinks that debate is completely over. Um, traditional trade policy is no longer a, a, a lever to assist domestic production, says Mark Thurwell from Austrade, which means a lot of the traditional debates we've ever had about trade and whether they will lose domestic jobs are also a thing of the past. So I've, I've been asked to give you a few uh, of the updates that came from the G20 uh, summit in Brisbane. I'd like to give a shout out to, to the Parliamentary Secretary for his work there. The trade session was by far the most animated. It was where um, Jakarta Widodo was the most animated. Um, thankfully, because there was a very last minute deal between India and the US, which meant that the WTO agreement on trade facilitation could move forward. Otherwise, it was going to be a very awkward pause, um, that particular session in Brisbane. Now, what is the G20 meant to do? It's meant to act as a circuit breaker on the most difficult areas of economic governance. And certainly the collapse of the Doha round in 2008 has got to be top of that list. But it has not been able to make substantial progress in this area. And uh, so what we get in Brisbane are some quite modest outcomes. Um, we're going to facilitate trade by lowering costs, streamlining customs procedures, reducing regulatory burdens, strengthening trade enabling services. They've been saying that for five years now. Um, so what you're seeing is a range of sequence behind the border um, uh, trade reforms, which are all good, but there has been no real ability to, to deal with the Doha round or resuscitate it or to change. And so now what we're hearing is World Bank economists saying, let's ditch it and start on the China round. Let's 
let's anchor China to the world trade or, uh, uh, multilateral regime. Uh, so this this is what we're really grappling with in the world of trade. A sort of a, the WTO, which uh, is really moribund at the moment, except in the dispute resolution phase. And so a whole range of countries are working around it in these series of ways. The way Australia is doing that is a range of plurilateral negotiations, like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, but also in a variety of other minilateral uh, fora. So I just wanted to quickly talk about MICTA because I think MICTA is going to be really important to the conflict area of trade. So mix, MICTA is Mexico, Indonesia, Korea, Turkey and Australia. It's a foreign policy grouping. It's only a few years old. Everyone goes, MICTA, what on earth? What do those countries have in common? What they have in common is they're not the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, and they're not the G7. Okay, so that's what they have in common. They're large economies who are not part of either of those groups. Uh, they're not a voting caucus of the G20, but they're obviously all in the G20, and so they have a, a great stake in making sure those conversations work. So Julie Bishop has invested a serious amount of political capital into the MICTA enterprise. Why? Because it's those middle economies who have the greatest stake in the rules of global governance working for us all. Uh, so that, I think, is a very interesting area of what Australia is doing in trying to be more agile and nimble. The other area is the Indian Ocean Rim Association, a very diverse assortment of countries held together by the Indian Ocean and not a lot else. Um, but in that, in that realm, uh, she's been focused, as Australia was the chair of, of EORA last year, on uh, women and trade and trying to increase... Uh, the access of women to formal trade in all those Indian Ocean Rim countries. Of course, great ancient trading nations, all of them. Uh, this is an area where there's enormous potential, both for macroeconomic growth and also for uh, human rights uh, progression. So I think that area of work is really important. So finally, I'd just like to say we were asked to talk a little bit about geopolitical drivers. And here I'm... Here I'm much more critical, I have to say, uh, because I think any geopolitical drivers uh, behind our trade policy that seek to contain China, and I do think that is the rationale of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Treaty, um, they need to be avoided. It is not a long-term strategy. As, as you could see by everything presented on the Asian moment up on the, the slides before. So when Mr Abbott reportedly told Angela Merkel, reported by John Garneau in the Sydney Morning Herald, that our policy towards China was driven by fear and greed. That was a very disappointing moment for most of us very invested in Asia-Pacific relations. The opposite is in fact true. We need a strategic vision about the inclusion of China in, e in economic governance from this moment forward. The emerging economies are not emerging anymore. They have arrived. The tipping point came a couple of years ago the emerging economies, so-called, are now bigger in GDP terms than most of our traditional economic partners. So we need to design rules that fit their needs, essentially. This is why the G20 is an important institution, but this is also why we need to have a sophisticated trading policy that understands trade negotiations as a source of conflict as well as a source of peace. Thank you. Well, thank you both to Alan and to Susan. Uh, okay, the floor is yours, please. Uh, questions? Oh, hands. All right, I'll have one down here and I have one there. Thank you. Uh, Nick Hurd from Ausfilm. Uh, this is a question for both of you. You mentioned the, the failure of the Doha round. I wonder if you could comment on the motivation behind the trade and services agreement negotiations that are happening at the moment as a means of uh, getting the, the WTO negotiations kick-started again. Uh, this is a very important development. What's happened in the WTO is that there are about 60 countries who total trade contributions, about 4% of world trade, and they're actually sitting in there as if they're in the UN and not actually interested in advancing the trade interests. So it's weighed down by that. And that's one of the reasons why the Doha round failed. The other reason was Indian obdurance. obdurance. Now, the uh, Australians took the initiative on services because the services agreement which was negotiated in the GATT was really quite uh, bare bones. It was always intended to be the next step. 
In fact, the Doha round should have been a round in which they would have fleshed out the commitments in that services agreement. Um, a number of countries decided they'd revert to the process where those countries who'd be interested could participate in those negotiations. So there's 50, there's the EU plus 25 other countries. And what they've done now is they're creating an extra set of commitments to put some teeth into the services agreement, and that will become what they call a new, in, 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 in um, WTO parlance, a preferential, a, a preferential agreement, meaning it'll only be applied to those countries actually joined. The very significance in this, though, however, is that it will actually break the deadlock that's occurred in WTO because um, at the moment they've got a decision-making process which sort of works by major by, uh, almost by consensus. So what they're going to do here is create a plurilateral agreement where the countries who are interested in advancing services and negotiating further commitments uh, will set up a, 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 another agreement and over time other countries can come and join it as they wish. In many senses, it's parallel to the sorts of negotiations that are going on in these other regional agreements. But it's, uh, it's something which is very important for revitalising the WTO. Yes, I, I just uh, underlines the point. Plurilateralism is the new black in trade. It's, um, it's very cool. Uh, and this minilateral thing, because we... we I mean, I, mean I, I still think the World Trade Organisation deserves support. I think the multilateral system is the one that Australia should be striving for. This is why I'm concerned about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. What, what they're going to do is the rules that are devised in the TPP are going to be brought to the WTO. It's very clear by all the statements of the BRICS countries, they're simply not going to stand for that. Uh, to, to not be a part of a, of a trade round that is then brought to the WTO, it's going to be a source of immense conflict. And I hope it doesn't um, uh, go over into the services, because obviously, if we, as everything we've heard, the modern economy depends on services. It's ridiculous that we don't have a services round concluded. So uh, we have some real, I mean, we have real problems in economic governance, just full stop. Uh, really, I don't think a group like this should be aware of just how dire it is at the international level, trying to get things done, anything done. And so we're just going to see more and more of these workarounds where really we need to be putting our investment into getting the multilateral system working again. Thanks. Uh, James Pearson, Shell Australia. So you've talked about the, um, the end of the traditional um, secret of bilateral trade negotiations and the uh, the loss of power of national legislative bodies. So when will we see an end to protectionism, including in Australia? I, I don't think we've seen an end because no one's come up with a better alternative yet to... Trade negotiations need to be carried out in a certain way to be efficacious. I think the question is what level of transparency is going to be acceptable to democratic uh, civil society and we haven't got that yet. Um, what the G20 has been most successful on in the trade area is what they call the protectionist pause. So at every G20 they come up with this idea that they will pause on, on new uh, tariff barriers and other protectionist impulses for the next year. It's a bit sad they can never do more than a pause. Um, but it is very clear that the pressure was on Australia to, uh, to put its money where its mouth is when it came to protectionist barriers when the G20 was held in Brisbane. And I think that being part of those big international conversations has been very good for Australia, uh, given us a lot more context and a lot more strategy. So I'm hoping that that would, uh, would have influenced or certainly exposed Mr Hockey and Mr Abbott to those concerns. I think you'll see pretty plainly that we are speaking from entirely different perspectives. I don't consider the G20 a particularly valuable institution and I don't think it actually delivers that all that much. It's turning out to be an increasing talk shop which over time you're now finding members of the G20 are starting to talk about emulating replacing the International Monetary Fund and other sorts of groups. Uh, on trade it merely parrots the same formula that's been saying the same thing about five or ten years. I actually also disagree fundamentally that these tr regional trade agreements are, are a problem. They are actually the answer, particularly the bigger ones. Now, the trick is to make sure that when the countries sign up to these agreements, and by the way, you mentioned TPP, China wants to be in the TPP. When Japan joined the TPP negotiations, it turned the heads in, in, in Beijing. And you had a change of administration. The reason we got that very good free trade agreement with China, where they gave us concessions, which were more than any other concessions that China's given, is until that point, China wasn't really willing to move beyond the established frame of what it did when it joined the WTO back 10, 15 years ago. 
hasn't actually advanced any, any, any progressive domestic reform since then. The new government wants further domestic reform. It's one of the reasons it wants to be in the TPP, and the Americans have said, you're not ready. And there's a degree of geostrategic playing here. But there is a difference. China and the US, the business communities, each want free trade agreements between them. And that will be the driver. And where we're going to see this manifest, as I said before, is we're going to see a free trade agreement of Asia and the Pacific, which will build on top of the TPP agreement, and which will build on top of the RCEP agreement, which was referred to by the parliamentary secretary. And that'll overarch the time, and that's where we're going to see something. Now, the challenge for keep keeping the credibility and authority of the WTO is to ensure that the measures in those agreements don't undermine it. Now, the one thing that remains extremely important in the WTO is its dispute settlement system. It is the most sophisticated system of international lawmaking and law regulation that you'll find anywhere in the world. That's quite startling. Uh, countries join that, and once they join it, it actually depoliticizes the debates on trade because there's common rules. So a country can stand up in the WTO and say to China, you're not abiding by this requirement because you're restricting trades for these reasons. Whereas they stand up in the UN, countries can't do that. They say, oh, you're not allowed to criticise my country. It's not the way it works. In the trade agreements, they've got formal agreements on the measures and it's very, very effective. So, yes, we need to be careful to look after WTO. But, and I don't accept that all these arguments about secret negotiations and so on, trade agreements have always been done, quote, in secret. It's the nature of the beast. Countries can't negotiate concessions without talking to each other and they can't expose them because interest groups will come and press, press against them. And the interest groups that are running in this country complaining about the trade agreements are noisy but small. They actually don't represent a very wide set of opinion, but by crikey, they can make a lot of noise. Please. Thanks, John. Uh, Alan, taking your point that um, uh, we're heading towards an Asia-Pacific uh, trade agreement, that the elements are falling into place, um, and you said it will evolve in a decade, which seems to be rather a long time. Do you think there's a case for Australia to make this actually a central objective of its trade policy and, um, and push for it in the way that it pushed for APEC um, 20 years ago? Uh, it is effectively doing that, John. At the last uh, APEC meetings in China, uh, what went relatively past without notice was an agreement which was actually put together by the Americans and the Chinese to start work to lay the bases for an APEC-wide free trade agreement. And that's always been an Australian objective. We've never shouted it with megaphones, but if you go look through the statements over about the last, last 10 years, you'll find it's been a consistent Australian view. So the short answer is yes. If I could just respond on the last point. You're absolutely right that the the, uh, the groups who are concerned about the TPP are very noisy, but I, I object to the fact they're small. The public health community in Australia is not small. Um, the, the public health community invested in the plain packaging uh, of cigarettes, for example. And also the, the, user, the users of the internet are not small, and they're very noisy. Um, I'm talking about people who are going to object if their downloading of Game of Thrones becomes even more difficult and more expensive. So... <coughs> It, the lobby groups are small, but the user base is large. And that's what we're seeing in, in the US, is that uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership has to be explained to the domestic constituency much, much better in order for it to gain political support. So there's a, there's a great saying in diplomacy by Robert Putman that it's a two-level game. You need to win the domestic, you need to coordinate the domestic, and then you need to win the international. I think on trade policy, we often win the international and we don't necessarily win the domestic very well. Um, but this is because we're in this new area, this highly new area of these mega regional trade agreements outside the multilateral framework. It's new, it's pioneer. Neither of us really know how it's all going to pan out. But it is an area that you should keep your eye on. Right. Uh, Baden Firth, Mitsubishi. Um, picking up on the game theme, uh, we're three nil, I believe, the state of origin of the FTA, um, and apparently the Indian one is not far from being concluded. So that would clinch the, the series for sure. Are we leading the pack? Um, let's say OECD countries. Is Australia should Australia be, be proud of the progress that we've made? 
I think we should be proud of the fact that we can do it in Asia without having to worry about the OECD. I mean, let's, let's look at the condition of the major Western economies. Europe is floundering. It's going to flounder for probably another decade at least. The United States, at last, we're starting to see some growth there. So, frankly, in the global economy, where we're seeing the growth and activity is, is in our region, and let's, it's basically China. Japan says it wants to rebuild its economy and re-stimulate growth. We'll see. The Koreans are a little bit concerned about it. So it's a very good dynamic in the Asian Pacific region. So I don't think we need to worry about whether we can pr pr parade ourselves around in the OECD or not. I think we've got enough to do in our own region. And just on that point, the ANU Crawford School has done some modelling on what would be the actual economic benefits of the free trade agreements. And they're, it's mixed. It's a mixed bag. Uh, but politically, they're a big winner. Uh, in terms of foreign policy, the fact that we are putting this energy uh, into strengthening those relationships is very important and quite symbolic. Uh, but as I said, the economic outcomes are mixed according to that research. Can I just add something there? There is one scandalous report produced by those people which they tried to show that the Australia-US free trade agreement caused trade diversion. And they used an economic modelling system which had been critiqued as... as, uh, as unviable and frankly it just was a silly proposition uh, if you think about it but the the bigger picture is which I mentioned before and I'll let me go in a little bit about this these agreements now are not about trading goods these agreements are about services and investment now the interesting thing about the Asian Pacific region is that if you look at the share of GDP generated from the services sector mm -hmm. in the Asian Pacific region 40 to 60 percent in the developed countries it's 80 percent now, we're not going to see the growth in the Asian Pacific region unless those developing countries liberalise their, their sectors. This will mean investment and opening up their services sectors so their services sectors start to generate a high percentage of GDP. Uh, there was a very uh, positive statement made a bit earlier about ASEAN by our parliamentary secretary. Uh, if you look behind the veil, ASEAN is actually struggling. They have a set of international agreements for services, trade and goods, which look very good on paper, they are actually not implementing on investment and are not implementing on services. Some of the ASEAN countries know this has to be done. And in fact, I think what's really important about this regional group, it will challenge them to start to open their services sectors, which will re-energise re uh, their growth. Because a number of the ASEAN countries actually haven't been doing too well in the last few years. Thank you. I have time for one final question, if anyone has. Oh, please, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Emil Bollengaita from Carnegie Mellon University, Australia. Uh, the uh, uh, prospects for uh, trade, uh, and you spoke, uh, um, Alan, about uh, you know that the G20 is not really that important. Uh, and I suppose one economist said that it's really the G2 that's, uh, that matters no? between uh, the US and, and China. Uh, the, uh, and the biggest risk it, that one of the biggest risks that was uh, alluded to earlier by the parliamentary secretary has to do with the South China Sea. Mm. And, and, uh, and I think the uh, complexities there are, are, are so significant given that even though it involves the G2, there are the bigger players, other countries in the region are also uh, engaged with, with their competing claims. Uh, what do you think, you presented a, I think an optimistic view that the trade will trump uh, uh, any uh, conflicting uh, tensions. Uh, do you do you s is that a more of a wishful thinking or or thoughtful wishing? <laughs> I could be pompous and say it's an educated guess. Let let's go back a step. I mean, this is to do with the politics of the Communist Party in China, and like all good successful Communist parties, it controls the military, the People's Liberation Army, because the People's Liberation Army has got a great deal of authority as well. Now, China still has not achieved its long-term target, which is to raise the living standards of all its people. It was in a race against the ageing population. It's actually losing that. Its rate of growth has fallen below what was projected about 10 years ago as what they're necessarily going to have to get for a long time to raise living standards. The Chinese leadership knows that the economy has still got to be made to work better. And it looks like, in the same way that uh, uh, the pre previous regime, too, back used WTO accession, as justification for, for liberalising the internal economy, there are signs that the current Chinese leadership is trying to do the same sort of thing and pointing in that direction. Uh, there's a huge amount of debt in China, their instruments in the services sector are quite weak, and yet what we're seeing is a process of change. And they now have a major stake in the global economy. I think one of the things that would have turned the Chinese head uh, over the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations is that when Japan joined, 
what we're seeing in this agreement are all the key components of the Asian Pacific supply chains and electronic goods, which are extremely important. That was one of the drivers of growth about the last 10 or 15 years. So China sees it as Trans-Pacific Partnership. Japan, Korea wants to join and will. The United States, Vietnam, um, Philippines is not in it. And China would say, just a tick, if there's going to be an arrangement here where there's going to be opening up and facilitating the supply chains, which for manufacturing is very important, they'd want to be in that too. So I think it, it'd be a toss-up for the Chinese leadership, what's more important, raising the living standards of Chinese people uh, or playing war games in the, in the uh, South China Sea. And, I mean, inevitably it has to be decided the internal decision inside the Chinese party about who brings the PLA into, into line. But uh, I would think what we've seen in China for the last 40 years is they've given priority to economic growth. And I don't see why that shouldn't change. Can I just add that um, after Turkey this year, China will be the host of the G20. So despite my, my colleagues' perfectly um, legitimate uh, misgivings about the G20, I think it's going to be a very important international moment when it will be China for the first time in charge of an economic governance forum of its own devising, uh, whereas, as it says, it's going to be a rule maker, not a rule taker. I also think it's important that Turkey will be the chair this year as the first Muslim majority country to ever host a, a major forum of international governance, and they've brought forward Islamic finance uh, onto the governance agenda. We're seeing more diversity in views about what are the rules and what should be the rules of economic governance. To me, that can only be a good thing. Um, but I will say that China is going to throw everything at its G20 uh, host year. Uh, it, it, you can see it already. It's going to be amazing to watch. Well, thank you to both our speakers. Uh, I think uh, what, what has been presented both by, or by the parliamentary secretary and now in the commentary that we've heard is that quite obviously this, uh, this broad question around conflict, trade, implications for Australia, uh, free trade agreements, uh, multilateral trade, uh, the impact of the G20, the impact of the G2, uh, containment of China, um, the fact that emerging economies have actually arrived, uh, the ditch Doha and onward and upward uh, with uh, the China round, all of these are, are significant and important issues and have an implication for Australia. If we're talking about the theme of this conference, which is old economy, new economy. As we move to this new economy, the significance of the services sector, as has been pointed out, investment and services fundamentally are the core of the trade agreements, not so much in goods these days, but the global supply chain nevertheless is a critical component of that as well. All of that, I think, uh, is uh, a good way to wrap up this morning's presentations, having, as I said a little earlier, set the scene with our discussion around old economy, new economy, what's needed, where we are, where we're going, what do we look like, to consider the implications internationally, international connectedness, get a government view from the Treasurer representing the Prime Minister uh, on government policies in that area and how we're setting ourselves up, and now bringing it together in talking about the real politic, if you like, of international connectedness, and that's, uh, I think, a, a very good point at which to end this discussion. Would you please thank both Alan and Susan.